Good morning once again. My name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here. I'll be opening up the word for us today from the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to open up to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And our topic today is hospitality. There's a few more other things to talk about. But before we get to the rest of the passage we're going to be talking about, let's look at it. Let's read it together. We'll pray, and then we'll open up the word today. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our God and Father, as we come to your word today, in this particular passage, at this particular time, to this particular people, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. As we just sang, we agree that we want you to speak to us, and we ask you to help open our hearts that we might hear and retain and apply and enjoy what you have said to us. May this word make a difference, that we can be your people as you build your kingdom in this region and throughout the world. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So we're talking about showing gospel hospitality. You see the passage up there on the screen if you've not um, opened your own Bible. But I don't want to just hone in on these two verses. This is kind of a topical message. And in, in so doing, there's going to be a lot of verses that we're going to cover. And I have passages of Scripture on the slides for you to look at. I also want you to recognize this is not just some hobby horse that a man is bringing to you to try to get you to think the way he thinks or to do what he wants you to do. This is what God has given us to do. And he's, he's made this word clear in numerous places throughout Scripture, and it, it has numerous implications for us as a church, and especially as a church plant, where we might be entertaining strangers. We might be getting to know people that we've not ever met before. We might be opening up our circles and our families and our community groups and our little networks to people that we've never met before. And this is an important aspect of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to let brotherly love continue, keep on loving each other, but we're also going to love the stranger. We're going to love the outsider. We're going to try to bring them in and help them feel the love of Christ because, as it says in the passage, we might even be entertaining angels without knowing it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Before we jump right into the passage, I just want to make sure we have the context of the book of Hebrews. I mean, we're not going to talk about the whole book, but, but the writer of Hebrews has, had put together a beautiful sermon extolling the superiority of Christ to angels, the superiority of Christ to Moses. Everything that Christ has done shows him to be the preeminent one. He is our great high priest. He is our supreme Lord. He is our Sabbath rest. He is the author and preserver of a better covenant. He's the better and final sacrifice for sin. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and he has given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That's the context for him asking anything of us. He's already accomplished everything. He's seated on the throne. He's ensured our salvation. He's brought us into the kingdom. He is, he's Lord it over us in a good way for our own good and for his glory. So what shall we do with this knowledge of God's supremacy in Jesus Christ? Well, at the end of chapter 12, he says, we should be grateful, and we are. We, we sang some of that this morning. We should also offer him acceptable worship, and we do. And I'm so glad to be a part of a church that loves to worship God, both in song and in prayer and in offering and in devotion. And we also bring prayers of thanksgiving, which, which Andrew just did for us there. So we're actually expressing all of the responses that are listed there in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. Then in chapter 13, we have these instructions, and they're not just advice. They're not just a good idea. They're actually presented as commands. So if God has done all this for us and brought us into the family and adopted us as his own children, and that we're all brothers and sisters, now listen up. This is what our Father wants from us, okay? Okay. He says, love each other, love the brothers. And when it says brothers in your Bible, that means brothers and sisters. The, the, the Greek word includes both genders, so it's not just brothers. Love your brothers and sisters, love your church, love the family of God. And then it says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. So you see there's brothers and sisters, and then there's strangers, okay? How good is it to be a part of a church that loves each other? My wife Robin and I have experienced 
much hospitality from many of you on numerous occasions, and we're very grateful for that. We are, we are so glad to be a part of a church that loves to have people into their homes, loves to eat together, loves to do things together. We've had great delight in doing things with many of you, and we're very grateful to be a part of a church that does that. I want you to know that makes me happy. That makes me really glad to be here. But that's where the word practice comes in. We, we don't just do it once, we continue to practice it. I think some of the men who were at the shooting event earlier last month recognize that I'm not very good at shooting. But if I practice, I may be only a little bit better, but I'll be better if I practice. And that's what the point of the word practice is. It's continue to do it. Don't just do it once. Don't just put a little, um, a little effort at it. Just keep doing it. Keep on practicing it. So we're going to look at three reasons why we're supposed to practice hospitality here. We practice hospitality because it's commanded by God. We practice hospitality because it communicates the gospel. And we practice hospitality because it commends Christ. It's commanded by God, communicates the gospel, commends Christ. As a church plant, we need to hear this. We need to hear hospitality in these three ways. So we want to develop it and make it habit-forming. We want it to be a habit of the body. That's why we want to practice it. So before we look at the hospitality part, the love of strangers, we want, we're told in, in verse, verse 1 of chapter 13, it says, let brotherly love continue. So why are we supposed to continue something? Why do we let it continue? Well, because we're prone to quit. You're usually commanded something because the opposite is your inclination. If you look in Scripture, you see a command, you, you think, well, what do I do that's the opposite of that, that, that I need to be told to continue, all right? Because we get busy, don't we? We've got a lot of things going on. We've got a lot of things going on in our lives, in our families, in our networks, in our work, in our recreation, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. There's a lot going on, a lot to pull you away. So we need to be told, continue. We also get distracted. We just have things we want to look at. We have our phones, and we have our screens, and we have our pursuits, and we have our delights, and we have our interest points and our hobbies. We can get distracted from what God has really given us to do. Or we get tired. It can be labor-intensive to try to care for other people, can't it? Isn't that true? We, we just finish the week and we want to rest. We get tired. Or we could also get isolated from other believers. And that's one of the things that community groups will do for us. It will give us an opportunity midweek, other than on Sunday morning, to gather with other believers so that we can practice this. We can practice the love of others. So we're told to continue because we're prone to quit. So don't quit. Keep on loving the brothers. That's those that are in the circle. That's those that are of the body of Christ, our family here, okay? We're to love the brethren. We continue. We don't quit. So back to hospitality. Why do we do this? Here's point one. We practice hospitality because it's commanded by God. We're right into the hospitality portion. We're supposed to love the brothers, and we're supposed to practice hospitality. So there's a couple of Greek words I want to open up for you here. The first word is the, the word for brotherly love. It's Philadelphia. The, the, the city was named after that. It's brotherly love. It's philos, philea, which means love, and adelphoi, which is brothers or brothers and sisters. So the, the word Philadelphia just means love the brothers, okay? The other word is philoxenia, okay? That's a, that's a Greek word that means love strangers. If you've ever heard the word xenophobia, comes from foreigners or strangers, fear of strangers, okay? And this is the opposite of that. This is deliberately going out of your way to spend yourself, to, to, to open up yourself to love strangers, okay? So two Greek words, Philadelphia, love the brothers, philoxenia, love the stranger, okay? But if you take that word, love of stranger, and you translate it, wherever it's used, it's what we mean when we say hospitality, it's hospitality. So when you think of hospitality, I wonder what you think about. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about when I say, let's go practice some hospitality? Do you think of a, of a lavish spread, of a, of a great big meal, or, or maybe you think of a, of a guest room in your home? Maybe you think of good food and, and, and lovingly prepared over a long period of time. Maybe you think of Thanksgiving. Maybe you think of welcoming someone home after a long journey, or just having somebody over for a cup of tea. Maybe you think of the hospitality industry. That's something that wasn't really present when the book of Hebrews was written. There weren't Sheratons and Hiltons and Super 8s. Uh, in fact, it was pretty gnarly. If you had to stay somewhere other than a person's home, the inns were not places of safety and comfort and good food. They were places of peril 
And you remember that from the birth of Jesus, right? There, there was no room at the inn and probably just a good thing. It wasn't a comfortable place to stay. It wasn't a safe place to stay. So we in our current culture have a hospitality industry. If someone's coming to town, they can book a room. And they probably have disposable income they can pay for that room. If someone's coming to town and they need a meal, they can go buy one at a place called a restaurant, which we don't have in the book of Hebrews. But we're not told practice hospitality until the hospitality industry develops and then you're off the hook where you can delegate that to the professionals. What the writer of Hebrews is telling us is since Jesus has done all this for you, adopted you into his family, you should do the same for each other. And not just those that you know, but those who are traveling, those who are not of your clan, those who are not of your family, those who are not of your origin, that, that you don't know them. You just love the stranger. That's what hospitality is, and it's not to be delegated, if it's at all possible, that you would take them into your home and love them like we are loved by God. And that's what we read in the, in the Declaration of Our Faith. We said we've been adopted, we've been shown hospitality, we, we were strangers to God, and He loved us as His own children, as His own family. So we see this in a number of other places in Scripture, and I'm going to run us through a few different passages. So we see it in Romans 12. Let's read that little passage there, Romans 12, 9 through 13. This is kind of essentially, in the book of Romans, this is what it means to be a Christian. It's kind of your job description as a Christian. All right? Once you're saved, once you have a saving knowledge of Christ, this is what it looks like. Love is genuine. You're going to hate what is evil. You're going to hold fast to what is good. You're going to love one another with brotherly affection. You're going to outdo one another in showing honor. You're not going to be slothful in your zeal. You're going to be fervent in your spirit. You're going to serve the Lord. You're going to rejoice in hope. You're going to be patient in tribulation. You're going to be constant in prayer. You're going to contribute to the needs of the saints, and you're going to seek to show love to strangers. Hospitality. Let's look at 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, uh, 8 through 10 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And then verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Why are we told to show hospitality to one another without grumbling? Because we're prone to grumble. <laughs> we need to be told that because it can be kind of an imposition. It can be hard work. It can, it can put, take you out of your comfort zone. It can rob you of something. I would rather just take a nap. Why do I have to have that person in my home? They're noisy. They don't do what I do. They don't eat what I like. They don't want what I want. They want to talk to me. They want to spend my time. They want to, they want to fill my space. They want to eat my food. I'm kind of grumbling about that. And what, the, what Peter is telling us here is do it and don't grumble about it, okay? Because that's what Christ did for us. We're the recipients of great grace. The perfect one has brought the dirty into his home and loved us as his own children. And he wants us to practice that so we can get a better idea of how loved we are. Do it without grumbling because Christ did it without grumbling. Cheerfully, joyfully. Um, my wife and I have some friends who are missionaries. They served in Kyrgyzstan. And our, our friend Sarah told a story when she was giving her testimony about preparing some food for her family. And, and if you ever have lived in a third world country, the food supplies are limited and they're questionable. And they do eat a lot of horse meat in Kyrgyzstan, in case you're interested. But she found some beef that was rare, but it was available. And she was cooking it up for her family. She had a rather large family, a number of kids and her husband. And she was making this and expecting her husband to come home later because it was going to be a, a, enough food for several days. And a neighbor came over, a Kyrgyz man, and the, the custom was, you welcome them in, and you feed them what they have until they leave. And that man came. I'm sure he smelled the cooking. He came inside. She welcomed him. He sat down, and she's cooking. So she brings him a plate. He ate the plate. She brought him another plate. He ate the plate. By the third plate, she's starting to count, saying, this is not going to be enough for what I would planned for, and we, we don't have a lot of money to spend. She continued to feed him until it was almost gone. And she said, the Lord taught me he serves beyond what I ever could do, 
and I was grumbling about this small meal that I was providing my neighbor. Yes, it cost her, and she did grumble. She confesses to have grumbled, but she was taught a great lesson about God's lavish richness toward us. He gives without ceasing. He gives without limit, and he gives without grumbling. So, give cheerfully. In fact, if you are interested in church leadership, the one of the qualifications for elder we see in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We have the slide for that. It says, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. It's a qualification for leadership in the church. You have to demonstrate this. You have to show that you can do it. It demonstrates that you get it, that you've already been invited into the, the household of the king. And in so doing, you want to do the same for others. That's a demonstration of your readiness for leadership, as if you're hospitable. It's also a qualification for a widow to be considered to receive the aid of the church. In 1 Timothy 5, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60, and other qualifications, and then there, there, if she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints. If she's demonstrated herself that way, it means she gets it, and, we, and she ought to be a recipient of some of the help that the church can provide. But it's a qualification. Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he was answering the question, who's my neighbor? Who, who am I supposed to love? And of course, Jesus said, well, whoever God puts you in the company of, that's the one you're supposed to love. Caring for a stranger is a humble response to God's command. I remember a, a time when I was um, visiting a church, and it was my first time at this church, and I didn't really know anybody at the church, but I, I came to the church, and I I sat down, and I was ready for the worship service to happen, and before the service started, Joe France came up to me, and he said, hi, my name's Joe, I wonder if you have plans for lunch today. And I said, no, I, I guess I don't. And so he said, I would like you to come to my home. We just live across the parking lot in the apartments. We're missionaries with Wycliffe, and we would just love to get to know you. So I went over to his house and had a meal with him. And the next time I visited, that very next week, Joe came up to me again. He said, I'm so glad to see you. What are you doing for lunch today? And I, my, wife and I, my wife was with me that time, and we went over to his home with our kids, and we plowed through his meal. And it was simple, and it was delicious, and it was lovingly given, and it made an impact on me. 20-some-plus years later, it made an impact on me. So we're supposed to practice that. We're supposed to continue. We're supposed to let that remain. Why? We practice hospitality because we're commanded by God. We're not grudgingly obeying. It's love for strangers out of our love for God. And so why do we practice hospitality? Point two, we practice hospitality because it communicates the gospel. And we see in Romans 8, this is what we talked about a little earlier, God's shown hospitality for us. He shows, us, he shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't, he didn't wait for us to get all cleaned up before he invited us to his house. He invites us in and makes us clean. Do you, see the, do you see the difference? When we love others, we want to love the stranger. When we go out of our way to care for those who are not like us or who are not from around here, we show the way God loves us. In 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. We, we have love to give because of the love we've already received from him. And this kind of love is sacrificial. Please, please don't mistake me. This is not something that you just snap your fingers and it happens unless you have a whole bunch of servants, unless you're living Downton Abbey. Then you just say, well, just put on another plate. It's no problem. I don't even feel it. But for most of us, it's a cost. And we bear that cost of another's blessing. Isn't that the way Jesus blesses us? Look at Romans 12, 19 through 21. It says in verse 20, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Who, who, who are we supposed to do that to? What does it say? The enemy. If our enemy is hungry, we're supposed to feed him. And we're, if he's thirsty, we're supposed to give him something to drink. That's the way God loves us while we were still his enemies. This is, this is a quote from Proverbs chapter 25, but it's, it's not unusual. Um, in fact, in in the, the Bedouin tribes in, in, in Arabia, it was actually, uh, the hospitality ritual was such that if, you, if there was someone who was your mortal enemy and they came to seek refuge in your tent while you were there, you were supposed to let him in, wash his feet, and feed him a meal. And then they actually have a rule that said, 
once he gets a certain distance from your tent on his way out, you can kill him. <laughs> but when he's in your tent, he's your guest. And you take care of him. And you bless him. And you feed him. And you honor him. Because the hospitality you're showing commends your God, which is much, much higher than your grudge. That's sobering, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus, sorry, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 5. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We remember Romans 5, 8 says, in Matthew, in Matthew 5, it says basically the same thing in a different light. It says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And, and that means there is a sense in which there's a ritual of, of doing good to those who do good to you, right? We get that. That's business, right? That's just good business. You want to develop your clientele and your network, and you want to, you want to have you know, good business relationships, so you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's fine, but that's not what hospitality is. If you love those who love you, that's, even the tax collectors do that. That's good. It's not wrong. You shouldn't stop. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying love those who don't deserve your love. Because God loves you, and you don't deserve his love either. Amen? So love God, love people. We did talk a little bit about entertaining angels unaware. That's probably, if you're interested in looking back into where that comes from, probably from Genesis chapter 18, where the visitors visited Abraham and told him about you're going to have, your, Sarah's going to have a child, Isaac, okay, and he entertained them in his tent. And then in, in Genesis chapter 19, there's some visitors, some angelic visitors who visit Lot and kind of save his bacon out of, out of Sodom. I can't say save his bacon to Jewish people. I've said save, save his hide from, from Sodom, okay? They, they get him out of town, right? They, they, they deliver him, and these are angelic visitors that he hosted, all right? They saved him, all right? So you never know who you're entertaining, Okay? You show that the family of God is not only people who are just like you, but that's people from every tribe and language and people and nation, just like in the book of Revelation. And Jesus said it too in John 14. He said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Does that not sound like hospitality? You walk up to someone and you say, you know what? I'd like you to come to my house and I have a place for you and I'd like you to be with me. That's what Jesus does for us in an eternal sense to save us from sin. And what he wants us to do is experience that firsthand on the giving side of it. We'll know him better when we do what he does. That's what he wants for us. We can't give someone salvation, but we can give of the gifts we've received from God's gracious hand. Just like when we give our offering, we can say, God has blessed me, I want to return it to him. I want to bless what God is doing. I want to take part in God's gracious work. That's why we give. It's also commanded, but we also want to do it cheerfully without grumbling, okay? And we also practice hospitality because it communicates the gospel, okay? This is, this, this is point two. And then point three, it's commanded by God. It communicates the gospel, and we practice hospitality because it commends Christ, okay? When my wife and I first visited uh, Crown Point, we first came up here we weren't sure the Lord was calling us here. We were just kind of checking it out. And we were having coffee together at uh, a coffee shop on the square. And we just struck up a conversation with a man who was kind of reading the news on his computer. He was sitting a table away. And we just struck up a conversation. And by the end of that conversation, he said, well, uh, what are you guys doing for dinner? Do you want to come over for dinner? I said, oh, well, we're already engaged. He said, well, when, when, what about later? I said, well, we're going to leave town. We were actually from far away. He said, well, when you come back, Here's my card. I hope you'll call us. We'd love to have you over. That communicates Christ. This man is a Christian. Goes to a different church, but he was willing to entertain strangers. People we just met in a coffee shop. It just happens that we were on a journey. We were kind of messengers. We, were, we told them we were, we were here thinking about coming to work at a church, but I don't think that's why he did it. I think he would have invited us if we were here just you know, looking for a job doing something else. He was communicating that Christ has loved him and he's loving us, and that commends our God. That shows that Christ has done much for him. He was a Christian. We were strangers. That's all it took. And when we talk about entertaining angels unaware, 
not being aware of who you have in your home. Can you think back to the Emmaus Road story? After Jesus was raised from the dead, and he, he started walking with the travelers, and they didn't recognize him. And what did they do? Well, they talked with him, and he, he opened up the whole Old Testament and gave them the story of Jesus. And they weren't sure what was happening. And he walked with them as far as they were going, went into the home, and what happened? He revealed himself how? What does it say in the Scriptures? It says, it says, we knew him in the breaking of the bread. And when they recognized him, then he, he disappeared. That's like that, I didn't have any idea what I was doing when I invited you into our home. I just wanted this stranger to come and be and break bread with us. And when we broke bread, there he was. Jesus was right there with us. Okay, that's like entertaining angels unaware. You, don't, you have no idea how God wants to bless you by bringing someone in that you don't know. And he loves us sacrificially, doesn't he? John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. He loves us sacrificially. And when we sacrifice our home and our comfort and our possessions, we do what he did. How many of you know the story of, of Francis and Edith Schaefer opening up their, their home in Switzerland to, to make a home for strangers, for travelers, to wayward souls. They called it Labrie, okay? It was like a, a refuge. And what I think the story goes that by the time that they had finished that ministry, not a single piece of their wedding china remained unbroken. And there were all kinds of stains on the carpet from things I wouldn't talk about here. But they had made an impact on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives of people they welcomed in, not knowing who they were. They shared a meal and they shared the gospel. And they developed a movement. But it was very, very costly. And they were very generous. Even as Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely and graciously give us all things? And he does it without favoritism, without partiality, and without expecting a return invitation. Remember, we, we talked about Matthew 5. It says, if you love those who love, with, love you, what reward is that? Offering hospitality is not something that you do so that you gain back. It's not something that you do to get a reciprocation, okay? And it's not something that you do because someone has earned it. God makes us lovely by loving us and bringing us in. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. He treats us like family. He invites us in, children of God. He makes time for us. He listens to us. He welcomes us. He shares with us of his abundance. That's what we're talking about doing for one another, okay? He loves us by giving of himself. And we say this every week when we give the call to worship in some way, shape, or form. Jesus opens his arms to the weak and the burdened, and we open our doors at Great Church, and we say, come and worship him. This is how we commend Christ here on a Sunday morning. How about you during the week? How about you in your travels? How can you communicate the open arms and the open doors of Grace Church by opening your doors, opening your arms, opening your table, opening your heart, opening your calendar to love others as he has loved you? He invites us to come to him, the weary and the burdened and the weak, and he heals us of our weakness. And how about the way hospitality commends Christ by preparing a table for someone? Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Jesus is the great king. He makes a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He serves us. He blesses us to overflowing so that we can be the servant of others. We can do unto others what he has done for us. And like the king that he is, he makes a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He serves us and blesses us. Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28, shows it again. It says, it shall, may not, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's, it's serving, right? This is, this is how we're supposed to follow him, by serving one another. And then the ultimate expression of hospitality is not really to brothers 
or even to angels, but it's to Christ himself. And we talked a little bit about this in our, in our Declaration of Faith in Matthew 25. Can we read this together? Let me read this to you. Just, just hear the love of God for his people and what he calls us to participate in. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Our hospitality commends Christ in his sacrifice, in his generosity, and in his love and in his service. So what does this look like? What are we going to do? What's, what's the takeaway? Yes, we should practice hospitality. What does it look like? What can we do? What are some tips? What is, what's some, give us some help. Okay, first of all, give of what you have, whatever that is, in your home whenever possible, okay? Just give of what you have. And be humble. Be humble about it. Rem remember Joe and Helen France, what they fed us was not a lavish banquet. It was just what they were eating. There was some leftovers, there was some of this, some of that. It wasn't a big deal, but it was a big deal to my heart. And then be humble. Be humble about it, because hosting is not boasting. You don't want to impress someone. You just want to love them. So make it simple. Uh, my wife, Robin, has a, has a friend uh, named Audrey Jensen, and Audrey said, don't wait until your home is done before you have people in it, because by the time it's done, all the people will be gone. Don't wait, okay? And make it reproducible, right? When someone comes in and experiences hospitality from you, they don't want to say, I could never do that. Don't make it like that. Make it something that they say, oh, I can do that. That, that was pretty easy. I, that seemed pretty doable. Make it doable, okay? Let them see you as you really are. Uh, I remember that we invited Brian and Lanisa Keith over to our home, and we just invited them kind of on the spur of the moment, and it just so happens that when they came in, there was, a, there was a basket of laundry. I think it was sitting on the couch. And Robin said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, she kind of shepherded the little basket away. And, and Lenisa, lovely lady that she is, she said, you guys have laundry? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have laundry. It's true. I'm sorry to break your heart. We have laundry. And so do you. And sometimes it's okay to have some dishes in the sink when people come over because then they go, oh, that's not that hard. I could do that. If you don't have any dishes, dirty some up and throw them in the sink, right? Okay, spill some stuff on the counter. Leave a diaper on the floor. Whatever it takes. Then don't just be reproducible. Be prepared. This takes some planning. So budget some time. You might want to double up on a casserole on Saturday. You want to budget some money? Guys, I'm leaving this to you. This is in your lap. Budget a hospitality budget for your family. Don't make your wife double up. You budget for it, okay? Budget your resources. Budget your energy. Don't run yourself ragged. Buy a few toys for the little kids that are going to come to your house and pray that they do. Then maybe prepare some questions to ask. Maybe read a book on hospitality. I know that, that Julia was, was passing one out to the, to the ladies. I think it's a great one. I read it. It's really good. And make it regular. Don't forget to do it. Remember, don't forget. Remember, practice. And then pray about it. Who should, who should we invite today? Okay? And then be delighted. Don't grumble. It's not good to grumble. And, and knowing what God has done for us, we really ought to be grateful all the time. So plan to enjoy your guests. Maybe their kids are not angels in disguise, okay? Maybe your kids aren't either. Let's just get together and love one another. And then be ready to accept when someone comes up to you and goes, hey, uh, you know, Pastor Brad kind of convicted me and I'm, I'm doing this without grumbling. What are you guys doing for lunch today? Okay? Be ready to go, yes. If someone invites you to your home, you say yes. Unless you're having like, you know, open heart surgery or something like that day or whatever. But try to say yes. If someone invites you to their home, that's a, that's a treasure. Think of the Bedouins, okay? The home is a very special place. So when they invite you, say yes. 
So if it's new or if it's awkward, just try it, right? Learning anything is, takes time. It takes practice. Just as Christ has welcomed you, welcome others. It's, it's not safe. I'm not guaranteeing anything like it's safe. It's not safe. It doesn't always come out the way you expect, and praise God for that. Sometimes it's not neat. Sometimes it's really messy, and your life gets changed, and praise the Lord. But we need you to do this, church. We need everybody to do this. This is not a if you feel like it, if you're so endowed, if you're wealthy, if, you're, if your house is perfect. There's no ifs in this. It's just do it, okay? Love each other, love the stranger. And don't forget, practice hospitality. Don't forget, because we're inclined to forget. Remember, hosting is not boasting. It's all just grace. It's all freely offered, whatever of you have. And in our hospitality to strangers or outsiders, we say, as former outsiders to the kingdom of God, as I've received, so I share with you. Come. You might be an angel. Let's pray. Fathers, we've opened up your word. We believe that you have spoken. And I pray that you would speak to each one of us in whatever way that if we're already really good at this, we could get even better. And if we've never even set foot in it because of fear or because of doubt or because of just a, a, a dim view of how you could work, I pray that you'd bust through that. Help us to take a risk to follow you and help us to see the blessing, see what's on the other side of it, to make a connection that we might never have made, that you might receive the glory, that we might know how you love us by loving others who are formerly outsiders, but who are being brought in to being brothers and sisters. And we pray this for the glory of Christ, that he would be commended by all who come to our home and that we might be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.